Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This is the first time that the World Law Congress organized one of their sessions on child protection. So uh, I am very honored to be asked, I was very honored when they asked me to put together a panel. And I am, ve I am very grateful to all my colleagues from all around the world. We have people from Scotland, Chile, New York, Pakistan, Ghana, India, Colombia, Spain. So all of them, the best people in those countries dealing with child protection issues at the moment, uh, they were very keen to, to join us in New York. So I think we have an excellent panel and it's going to be hopefully a lot of uh, interesting and fruitful discussions on child protection this afternoon. I invite you all please to interrupt politely whenever you want to ask a question, to share with us your comments about the different topics that we are going to discuss this afternoon here. So uh, my name is Carolina. I am a lawyer in London and also qualified in Spain. I am the vice president of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. You are going to hear that uh, quite often this afternoon. We have many fellows of the International Academy of Family Lawyers here. And it's an association that is uh, formed by professionals doing family law, children law, uh, exclusively. So um, we are going to start with uh, Lavinia. Lavinia um, Regunathan Fischer. Lavinia is with us uh, from India. Lavinia is an expert in private international law. She's educated in India and in England. Is author of many articles and books. Her last book is on state and justice. And she was telling me that she's really, really happy. She was in tears yesterday because for the first time they got an adoption order in India where finally the authorities were involved to make the adoption process a bit quicker and more child friendly. So Lavinia, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for joining us in New York. Thank you. So thank you to Carolina for bringing together such a nicely representative panel. Um, the first step in giving a voice to multiple, uh, to uh, those who don't have a voice is to allow multiple languages and cultures to participate. So thank you, Carolina. Uh, well, I'd like to begin by uh, painting a picture, if you may. So if a Martian were to land in India and look at the statutes on child protection, I think they would be pretty satisfied because things look pretty good. But if they attempted to see the law in action, it would immediately get much more confusing. It's not only poverty that makes these laws difficult to implement. It's a lack of focus and confidence. The state over the last century has built on this insecurity by being completely allergic to living law, which allows for structures built in non-adversarial ways to come to the fore. So policy making currently continues to close its eyes to reality and continues to push its multicultural legal traditions, a source of strength to the sidelines. Indian lawmakers face the challenge of balancing convention and practical requirements. Labor laws are an example. So um, the convention uh, requires uh, prohibition until the age of 18. India allows it until the age of 14. In 2020, the National Human Rights Commission has published an analysis on child protection laws in India and analyzed their adherence to the CRC. But the push is more towards uniformity and not necessarily equity or flexibility. This brings me to my next analogy of the Juvenile Justice Act in India as the supermarket of child protection laws, each aisle containing multitudes, screaming contradictions. Who protects the child in this presence of plenty? So in the tussle between the state and the parents, black letter law, practice and process, the voice of the child is barely heard. The importance of gender sensitivity, the protections required in the digital age are but fleeting footnotes to adult-oriented themes. Within this pitch for an inclusive pluralist structure, I would like to situate five issues. The varying age protection for a minor, so who is a child? The age varies for purposes of criminal law, labor law, um, education, development, but this is not necessarily bad because a degree of flexibility ensures a higher chance of enforcement. All I would request is that alignment be sought. The delays and gaps caused due to excessive bureaucracy, leading to a subversion of the best interest principle and the aims of the CRC, is another crying and pressing concern. 
This is evident in the fact that in the last five years, both domestic and inter-country adoptions have fallen by 30%. Surrogacy arrangements have been largely regulated out of legality. And nevertheless, families are willing to spend huge sums of money trying to obtain surrogate arrangements abroad. So instead of creating a protection framework for all the parties involved, uh, based on the interests of the child, India's flexibility and tolerance of these arrangements is going into the background, is receding into the background, and uh, leaving a more inflexible system of law in its place. Outdated notions of legitimacy, which the courts have been chipping away at, and in this context, the rights of the parents as opposed to the rights of the child, are also some, a cause of concern for me. Rights of children within the confines of gender and politics, laws relating to gender identity are developing, but with a focus on adult requirements, and less with a view to providing support systems from early on. The rights of children in the digital age, cyberbullying, abuse, and crime, have laws on paper, but again, enforcement is lax, and the understanding uh, and sensitivity to enforce is low. Um, I have to say that the, the, dig the digital age could help India and protect children. But instead, the fact that the voice of the children is not heard and it's only an adult-oriented security network that makes children the weakest, the weakest party in this whole uh, uh, you know, uh, process. India needs to ensure it does not move to a retributive model and instead retains its rehabilitative model. Alignment with international convention needs to be done, keeping its own unique contexts in mind. India, for example, allows a, a, abortions till the 20th week and in some exceptional cases till the 24th, but at the same time has outlawed sex-selective abortions. While one may question the wisdom of bringing a child into a cruel world, this nuance is important. And this flexibility will build a child-centric system as opposed to one where the rights of the child are an afterthought. Let me close by giving an example. Yesterday, we obtained a positive order in a case trying to cut down the thicket of procedure in international adoption orders. While ease and speed are still a few steps away, these orders show that the fight continues and the steps, though small, are in the direction of safeguarding the best interests and the rights of the child in a working together model where the judge, the legislator, and the lawyer try to get the voice of the child into the forefront instead of their own. Thank you. Well, very interesting panoramic in India. So what is the age of a, a criminal uh, for children? Because yes, in, so in, in, in the UK it's 10, which I was quite surprised. Yes, it's as low as seven. And seven. If, yes, and if the child is uh, not considered capable of taking a decision knowing right and wrong, it's 12. So it's possible uh, the children as low as... But with the Juvenile Justice Act, again, this is ambiguity. In the interest of time, I didn't give this example, but the problem is that a child uh, under the Juvenile Justice Act would have the age of 18, but the Indian Penal Code allows 7 and 12. So these contradictions have to be cleared by judges. And uh, what about the uh, adoption process, the international adoption process? Yeah. How long does it take for an international adoption order in Once India? Again, the best interests of the child are completely ignored because it can take anywhere from two to three years uh, for a complicated adoption, which is why adoptions have fallen by almost 30% both domestic and international, because institutionalized adoption with this reliance on paperwork uh, without any sensitivity and whether the parents know each other, uh, you know, not taking into, any, uh, taking into account any of these items has created such a long and bureaucratic and highly expensive procedure, which is what we tried to fight and got the order for yesterday, because we're asking the government to, uh, uh, to answer why it doesn't step in and make the process flexible uh, reasonable, reasonably timed, and not so expensive. Thank you. Thank you, Lavinia. Um, okay, so we are going to move from India. We move to New York. We have here the Queen of Brooklyn, I have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Pam, uh, Pam Sloan, the big Pam, big in the sense of uh, professionally, Pam Sloan, the first lawyer that I met from New York, and someone that for me was like someone to, you, to look at. You've led yeah. a very cloistered life. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pam Sloan uh, has practiced family law in Manhattan for more than 40 years. She's, uh, she's, she's now a founder and partner of recognized boutique firm Ar Aronson, Majeski, and Sloan LLP just around the corner. We have a delicious lunch. Thank you so much, Pam, for your hospitality. Pam advises and represents her, uh, her clients in all aspects of family and divorce law. And she's also a fellow of International Academy of Family Lawyers and very well known, not only in New York, uh, I will say, uh, for those who practice family law, international family law all over the world. So thank you, Pam, for agreeing to be with us today. Well, you're very kind. You're very kind. And hello, everybody. Um, in fact, the topic I'm speaking on, I was asked to speak on, is one that, that I came to know about. I don't necessarily practice in this area, but through my involvement in the IAFL, I, I decided many years ago to serve on a committee that at that point in time, little did I know, that did not touch my life, the um, uh, LGBTQ plus committee interested me just because it would give me, a divorce lawyer, an opportunity to really do something that I actually did go to law school to do, which was to deal with justice and rights. You know, we all fall into a job along the way, but there was a point in time when we had stars in our eyes and we wanted to become lawyers. So it was through that, through this organization that I became involved in that committee. And I am here to talk to you today about something that is very, very timely, which is, um, the rights of transgender children throughout the world. Um, we have a very short amount of time and it's a gigantic topic. So for the most part, what I, what I will be doing is um, issue spotting um, about issues around the globe. But I'm, I am going to ask right now for some assistance, if you would just take one of these and pass it around because I'll, I'll come to this later. Um, to, oops, a little messy, I apologize. But if you would just, I'll leave the schmutzy one in here. That, that's, my, that's my New York, the schmutzy one, you know, the messy one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, Carolina said, what would you like to know about? I said, I'm probably the only one who has a genuine Brooklyn accent. <laughs> I didn't just move to Brooklyn because it's cool, like, actually, I'm from Brooklyn. Okay. Um, so I will issue spot with the goal being to make each of us aware of the extraordinarily serious issues trans children. And I'm, I'm saying children and not youth because I think we tend to think of youth as being maybe a little older. We're talking about children. We're talking about kids. And I think it's a more powerful word. I would like to start with two sweeping, bold propositions. Proposition one. No matter where in the world you live, no matter where, and this includes New York City, there's a slogan that should be embraced by all who embrace the scientific research regarding medical treatments for trans children, and that is this. Gender affirmation is suicide prevention. There is a 14 to 15 percent decrease in suicide risk in trans children if the hormone replacement treatment is started between the ages of 14 and 17. Per the U.S. National Institute of Health, 82% of transgender youth consider suicide, 40% of transgender youth or children have attempted suicide. And note, according to a researcher at the University of Massachusetts, there is an unknown number of transgender youth who could, who could not access HRT therapy during their adolescence who took their own lives and don't appear in the research because they were never a participant in any of the programs where they could get this kind of treatment. Proposition two, no matter where in the world you live, the only place a transgender child is safe truly safe, emotionally and physically, 
in this entire world is within the four walls of a trans rights, trans social, emotional, and medical services center. Why do I say that? This population is under threat from parents who will not accept them, from family members who will not accept them, from schools will, that will not accept them, where they literally cannot use a restroom in a safe place, from communities that will not accept them, from sports teams that will not let them play in the United States. They are under threat from party planners and cake makers who will not accept them and work for them in preparing a party. Many of them have no access to emotional health care. They have no access, many of them have no access to gender affirming medical care from hormone treatment to reassignment surgery. And if they live in a place where care is legal, they need parental consent and the cost can be prohibitive. There is an, they have an inability to obtain proper documents, um, thereby living a life where when they show a document, their secret is revealed because they're identified as a gender they don't believe themselves to be. Now, because we're discussing children, I will not address adult rights of transgender people, rights to marry or not, rights to be parents, nor will I address the consequences for parents who choose to help their transgender children obtain medical care relating to gender affirmation. In the United States right now, many parents can be accused of child abuse and even face felony criminal charges. They can go to jail if they make these services available to their children. Speaking globally first, Every one of us sitting here is aware of these issues for children in your own jurisdiction. From a high altitude, I can give you some st st uh, statistics. Concerning non-binary people, and again, children, 15 countries recognize some combination of non-binary or third gender, including intersex people. So 15 countries recognize that third gender, if you will. And there's been lots of recent le uh, legislative action, both to legalize the recognition of third gender people, but also to ban it. Here you go. Just very loosely, but this is, this is I believe, rel within the last few months. Here you go. Uh, recent changes, uh, the recognition of non-binary people in May of 2023, not legally recognized in Pakistan, recognized in Mexico, was, was recognized in Mexico. Intersex only is recognized in España, um, recognized in Queensland, recognized in Hidalgo, which I think is Mexico, but in where? Hidalgo. Hidalgo, that's, uh, it's a state. It, it, that's right, but so it's here twice, so you get double the credit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Recognized in Chile. Ooh. Yes, indeed. Um, intersex only in Kenya. Uh, Pakistan, not recognized. Spain, intersex only. Did I say this already? I'm sorry. Australia, recognized. Canada, recognized. Kenya, interstate only, Chile, recognized, okay. Not legally recognized. In Asia, Afghanistan, Bahrain, China, Indonesia, Iran, Israel, Japan, it goes on and on and on and on. Europe, Albania, Andorra, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Belgium, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Italy, Isle of Man, Ireland, Greece, it goes on and on. North America, and uh, to me, this is more the Caribbean, but nonetheless, here we are. Anguilla, Antigua, Barbuda, Aruba, Bahamas, Barbados, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Africa, Angola, Botswana, Cameroon, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and then there are countries where there is no data, no laws, and it's very ambiguous, so people are living in fear. 
Excuse me? India oh, uh, uh, India, please. If your country recognizes, and I didn't say it, please do. Please let us know yeah. because round of, I mean, I know I'm letting you know how I think about this. Maybe that's inappropriate, but nonetheless, I, that's a good thing. Go India. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, gender affirming, legal in 102 countries, but in that 102, con but of the 102, only acknowledged if you have the, the surgery. So one can't transition without having the surgery. Again, lots of recent legal action. Um, and here I'll read it from here. Uh, legal in New Zealand, surgery not required. Pakistan, illegal. Uh, Finland, uh, legal surgery not required. Bulgaria, illegal. Um, where is surgery not required in Hong Kong? Uh, surgery not required in España. Am I saying that correctly, España? Yeah. I'm trying. Let's no, I'm less Spaniel, but I'm trying. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, surgery is, so you see where, I'm, and, and then illegal, all the countries that you would, you would think of, okay, that we just went over. So that's a highlight so that I could be sure to have touched on everything else. And I was very delighted when I found out what my colleagues were going to, that they were talking about only their countries, so a sigh of relief that I could limit it to the U.S., because God knows we've given you a lot to hear about in this topic. At the, here in the U.S., at the same time that our doctors, clinicians, researchers, such as the American Medical Association, are strengthening support for gender-affirming care for trans children, our politicians are weakening them, if not eliminating them eliminating them. You, you have this map of the U.S., you see the different colors, you can already figure out what it means. And in the U.S., we have our own, we have our own cross-border issues, as, as you're all aware. I, I'm always, I always sit back and I listen to you talk about India, a huge, important country, but there's one law, as opposed to the United States, where every single state has its own law. In accordance with the human rights campaign, 31% of transgender children live in states that have already banned gender-affirming care. 13% of transgender children live in states where there is a push to reverse the existing right to gender-affirming care. We've seen a lot of the re recoiling of rights in the United States lately. In the United States, I repeat, all major credible medical associations have endorsed gender-affirming care as science and evidence-based, proven and essential medical treatment for children suffering gender dysphoria. Nonetheless, we have elected politicians who embrace the notion that affirming care is experimental. An example is a Texas congressman Dan Crenshaw, on paper, I should this is rather snarky, clearly a, an educated man. He went to a, Tufts University in Harvard, and sadly, Rachel, he's Scottish born. We don't take him. But he was raised <laughs> here, care. so okay, <laughs> just letting you know. Um, and this is what he said. This is the bill we're going to die on. This is taxpayer money, and when 70% of taxpayers opposed these barbaric treatments on minors, then taxpayers should not fund it, he asserted, Texas. So that congressman is willing to die on that hill while other people's children are killing themselves on suicide hill or are being abused in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of places with no protection from those who have chosen to fight this anti-science battle. And you can see what's happening by looking at the map. What does this mean? Orange, orange is the only place where these children can get the care. What does this mean for trans children in the, in the US in real time? I'm old school, I get it delivered. And I know because I commuted on the subway, I know how to fold it so I can read it on a crowded train. Here you go. July 8th, 2023, above the fold, that's very big for the New York Times stories, above the fold, more important. And it says, to fight state limits on trans care or to flee. 
West Des Moines, Iowa. You can see where that is on the map. The middle of the United States, the breadbasket, IA under Minnesota. David and Wendy Bachelder hate the thought of putting their spacious home in West Des Moines on the market, disrupting the routines of their six children or giving up the Lutheran church that they have attended for nearly a decade. But two new laws have left them debating whether to leave Iowa. A ban on a medication that pauses puberty taken by their transgender son, Brecker, was signed into, the law, into law by the state's governor in March. The same month, teachers informed Brecker that he could no longer use the male restroom and locker room at his middle school after another law was approved by the Republican-led State House. This happened to a 12-year-old boy and his family who um, have a life in Iowa and are now in this position of having to move to make change in order to get care for their child. I, I know I'm running out of time. The article goes on to talk about not just this boy, but the doctors who are treating this boy who are now leaving this state because they don't want to, they don't want to be um, accused of crimes. They want to practice what they went to medical school um, to, to, to practice. I'm almost done. So, so what are we to do about this as lawyers? As lawyers, we litigate. As citizens, we support organizations whose mission is to fix this for our children, if that's what we believe needs to be fixed globally. But as humans, and I, I know this might si sound trite to a group of lawyers who've come from around the world, but maybe small sometimes is the answer. Mm -hmm. um, as humans, we can humanize this. We can harness stories of trans children and their families and tell them. It's much easier, I have found, to dismiss an idea than it is to dismiss a person. And what might seem trivial isn't. I can do this quickly, but this is personal. Um, I joined, I told you, I joined this organization before I knew I had a, a personal relationship to it, to, 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 the, um, to the committee, LGBTQ. My fourth child was born in 2021, in 2001, excuse me, Owen Patrick May. At approximately 12 years old, we recognized, and some of my friends here too, I'm looking at you, Rachel, that he was depressed, he was anxious, he was becoming morbidly obese, he had obese learning problems. By the time he was 15, he had told his father and me that he was gay, and by the time he was 16, he told us he was trans and gay. So at this point we were told, and fourth child, pretty cool people, grew up in New York, open minds, that he is a trans woman who is a lesbian. A lot to hear, uneducated ears. Um, we as mom and dad said, what are you talking about? How could this be? You're confused. We're gonna get some help. You have identity issues, you were adopted. You're just worried you don't fit in. Learning disabilities, it's a fad, all of this. We'll figure it out. We thought it was bizarre. We sought help, but I now know we were seeking help for us and not for him or her. We wanted someone to tell us, don't you worry. It's a fad. It's a this, it's a that, it's a something, it's not real. Happily, we live in a place where we found really good help and persistent doctors who persevered, and we realized, no, we're the ones who needed the help. Certainly Sasha needed help, but so did we. And we're six years later, and we're one week away from Sasha Elizabeth having her gender-affirming surgery. Now, Owen transitioned to Sasha, but her family transitioned to better educated people albeit still frightened for her safety in a very mean world, but not, not worried, not worried about her health. And here's a truly astonishing thing for me, that recently a judge for whom, with whom I work on a committee, I, I had to let her know I couldn't do something in August because of this event, and instead of writing back what so many people say, oh my goodness, this is so hard for you, 
we wish you well, we wish you this. She simply wrote back, wow, congratulations, what a great time for your family. And I was taken aback, I showed my husband, and we were both taken aback. I'm looking at you, Richard, Justice Waterman Marshall, amazing. And we looked at each other and we said, she's right. Once again, we're still, my point is, we're still learning, one family at a time, all of our friends around us, one family at a time, and every single person who six years ago looked at this like, glad it's not me, is now saying, how's it going? And it's just not as odd. And again, I know we're lawyers, and there's so many more important ways of dealing with human rights, but when you start with each other, it's a good spot. Um, I know that the heroic lawyers will continue the fight for basic human rights for these children, which at its core is the right for them to be their authentic selves. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pam, for bringing the protection of these children to the table to bring this issue to the World uh, Law Congress. And let's hope that next year those, that list of countries keep growing and not decreasing, no, well, because that will be the worrying. No, Caroline, you're right. Of, of all the things in the world to be afraid of, this, especially in our country. Yeah. Wanda Sykes, I don't know if you know Wanda Sykes, great comedian, had some kind of thing that said, until, wait, what was it? Until a trans man breaks into an elementary school and kills ch children by beating them over the head with copies of To Kill a Mockingbird, we're thinking about the wrong issues. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a pleasure to have you here. No, don't worry. Okay. It was a very important issue that we need to, to discuss in this uh, forum. So we are moving from New York to uh, Pakistan. Uh, with Sulema Jahangir. Uh, Sulema is my partner. She's a partner at Dawson Conwell Solicitors. Uh, she's a dual qualified lawyer in England and in Pakistan. She practices all aspects of international family law. She's also the founder and member of organizing committee of the Asma Jahangir Conference, which is the largest international legal conference in Pakistan. And Sulema, uh, I, rem I, I want to highlight one of her biggest achievements recently is a uh, forced marriage protection order to a lady who is living in the USA in America. So she doesn't have limits when she wants to protect children and young adults from forced marriages. Sulema, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you for that very uh, nice description. And thank you to both Pam and Lavinia for your oh. very uh, enlightening talks. Um, uh, so my topic today is different uh, from both of you. Obviously, it's about child protection, and it's about Pakistan. And I was just thinking, gosh, what can I talk about? Because uh, we have so many issues uh, related to child protection in Pakistan. I mean, literally, it would take me weeks. So I had to pick out one very discreet topic where I could say that our, our state has completely failed us, and there is a solution that they could put in place but, but have not done it. Um, so I'll start by talking a bit about Pakistan. Um, for those who don't know, it's a home to 225 million people, and uh, out of which 45% are children, which is 45% of our population is under 18 years. So it is the largest group of the population. And um, in terms of context, um, child protection, it is sadly quite a depressing uh, context. Um, in Pakistan, well, four out of ten children are, uh, are stunted, which means that they are malnourished. 17.7% um, suffer from wasting. Our literacy rate is probably one of the lowest uh, in the world. And our human development index is also one of the lowest um, uh, in the world. Uh, we, have, uh, we are an ex-colony of the British, so we have inherited um, a legal system and legislation that is not where the ethos is not about child protection, but it is really about discipline, punishment, and extraction. And um, this was since our um, independence in 1947. Sadly, we have not made a lot of changes to this ethos of the law. And a lot of the same sort of legislation and legal processes continue. Um, and that is because we have not had the opportunity to have proper democracy in Pakistan. We have had long periods of direct military rule, 
what we call hybrid rule, indirect military rule, and very, very weak um, democratic governments. Um, so within this context, where ch a, an ordinary Pakistani citizen or a child, you are, when you think about child protection and you think about the state or the law enforcement agencies, you don't think protection. You think, well, they are here to grant impunity to perpetrators and, um, and not protection to vulnerable people and to children. And this is generally the, the kind of mistrust that people have with the, um, with the state in Pakistan. Within this, I'm going to be talking about child marriages and forced religious conversions of children from religious minority groups and how both of them have a nexus. And I'll explain that in the talk. So there has been an inability of our state, different governments, um, military and non-military, of trying to eradicate child marriages. Um, you know, eliminating child marriages is a, a sustainable development goal, um, that it should be eliminated around the world by 2030. Pakistan is, a, Pakistan is a party to various treaties, to the Child Rights Convention, as well as CEDAW, as, and, very, um, and regional treaties on, on eradicating child marriages. Um, currently in South Asia, which is where Pakistan is, uh, one in four child marriages around the world happens in South Asia. So South Asian countries, there is a lot of child marriages anyway. Uh, and Pakistan is not the worst in South Asia, but we have about uh, 19 million child brides, which means that one in six brides as of 2017, according to UNICEF, uh, in Pakistan, one of, one of six brides are children. Um, so if you look at the statistics from the study, <coughs> what you will expect that a lot of these ch child brides are come from very poor households, they have hardly any education, and they come mostly from rural areas and not urban centers. So what is the law? So the law in Pakistan, we have a majority act, which says that everyone, uh, you have to be 18 um, to, uh, uh, to be a major, to not be a minor, but it excludes marriage. So while you can't enter into a contract or you can't do a lot of things or you can't vote, but you can get married if you're under 18. Um, so the, our law is kind of in a, in a very strange situation, which is like a lot of our laws, because our state is so busy trying to uh, solve other problems that they haven't paid attention to it. So while there is no minimum age really for marriage in Pakistan, there is an offense of child marriages. So in, the, in, in three of the provinces, if you're under 16 and you're a female, it's an offense um, if you're married. And for males, it's 18. In one province, it's 18 for both, uh, both females and males. Um, but what happens is that the law is, uh, is hardly ever implemented. So you see one in six brides are, child, are children. But do you see any people who have been imprisoned because of child marriages? Uh, you don't see anyone. There are hardly any judicial precedents. There are hardly any cases where people are imprisoned, um, uh, where child marriages are concerned. Uh, but at the same time, when there have been cases that have come to family courts where there is a child involved who has been married, the courts have said the marriage is legal. And that is because, and this is not all the courts, and I'll explain, but majority of our decisions say, well, the marriage is legal, because as per their own interpretation of Islamic uh, rules or Sharia, they say, well, all you need to be to get married is to have physical puberty. And if, that, if you take that to the ultimate limit, you could even say that a nine-year-old could get married because some girls you know, have physical puberty at, at the age of nine. So this is the problem that we have in Pakistan. The law is not clear, and child marriages are therefore rife. Not many cases actually do come to court. Where you see where the cases come to court are cases where there's a forced religious conversion along with a child marriage. And the family is against the marriage. That is the case that usually comes to court. And there have been a lot of cases like that. And they have also been raised and, and have had some press attention. So um, in Pakistan, 97% of our population is Muslim. And we have 3%, so a very small percentage, which are non-Muslims and they are mainly Hindus and Christians. And um, what is happening is that our non-Muslim population is very, very hurt because they feel what is happening is that their young people and young girls, actually, 
are being forcibly converted to the dominant religion, which is Islam. And it is being done by men who are saying, oh, we get married to them, and no, now they have converted their religion. And that's it. And when their parents take the case to court and say, well, hand back our child to us. She is 13. She is 14. She, she cannot convert. Well, the court says, sorry, you know, physical puberty. She is married. She has changed her religion. And now she will go off with her husband. And after that, literally, the child is lost to the parents. And in a lot of these cases, what you see is that that child is told, well, now you have converted to being a Muslim, so it is not right for you, which is not anything that has to do with religion, but sort of that is the way that they are brainwashed, that you cannot go and meet your parents because they are non-Muslims. So in a way, those children then completely fall into a black hole. So uh, how many people are we talking about? Well, some of there are some estimates. One organization estimated that there were 1,733 conversions between 2000 and 2012. Uh, according to two organizations, there were 159 cases of forced conversions in between 2013 and 2016. And, but what the religious minorities in Pakistan have described is that forced marriages and conversions are the most hurtful issue uh, for them. Um, if we look around the region, uh, in India, in some states, Nepal, Myanmar, and Bhutan have all outlawed forced conversions. And in some cases, with more severe punishments where children are concerned. Um, in Pakistan, the issue of forced conversion came up in the Supreme Court in, uh, in a case recently. And the Supreme Court said, well, we don't really need a law banning forced conversions because under our constitution, everyone has the right to practice their own religion. But I mean, I felt that that was quite a hypocritical thing for our court to say, because the court knows very well that even though the Constitution says that, the law is not equal in its implementation. And it's always to the detriment of the religious minorities. And um, you know, I hope that the court will refrain from, uh, refrain from paying lip service to rights that are not implemented. Um, in Pakistan, there have been some efforts by the government to, um, to eradicate forced marriages. There were two laws that they tried to pass in 2016 and 2017 when they came under pressure from the international community, particularly the European Union, the CEDO and uh, the monitoring bodies under the CEDO and CPC. But both those laws were never passed into law. They were agreed by the assembly, but the upper house didn't sign them because of um, pressure from the right-wing, um, extreme right-wing bodies. Um, so sadly, th that has been a missed opportunity. Um, recently, we've had a judgment from the Islamabad High Court, which is not the apex court, so it's not the Supreme Court, where they have, where the judge has said, well, we cannot, where there was a young girl, but no forced religious conversion here, and she was under 15, uh, and the court said, well, forced, a forced uh, uh, a marriage, underage marriage is void, completely void from the very start. So it's void ab initio. And, and, and prepared a long judgment giving very good reasons. But at the same time, the court did not provide proper guidance because in other, didn't say, well, if someone has been married under 16, what protections could they have? Now in Pakistan, sexual intercourse is without, outside of marriage, is, 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 um, there is a, it is an offense. So if some, so I had a case recently, two months ago, where the girl was under 16, and she was married to, an, to a British national and came to England and had a child with this guy. And then he said, three years later, he said there was a divorce. And he said, but we were not, we were not married. So uh, if you look at that judgment, that would be the right thing. But I think a court would not agree to that, because then you are victimizing the, the child bride twice. So I think we need to have a policy, not from judges which are saying one thing and the judge is saying another thing, but really from the parliament to, to outlaw um, uh, underage marriages and to have a minimum age put in place. And this would not only just impact the girls in Pakistan, but also minority groups and remove their sort of um, frustration uh, that it will not have, that their children are not being forcibly uh, converted. Um, so I hope that our, uh, the state will have its priorities. One of the priorities will be to make these improvements um, uh, for child protection. 
but given the power struggles that are going on and uh, you know at the failure of a, a proper democratic system i am not that hopeful but thank you very much thank you Thank you so much, Ulema. We, we are running quite bad on time, so at the time we don't have time for questions, but you can approach any of the speakers and we can pass you your details if you want to discuss anything with them. Uh, we are going to move from Pakistan to Ghana. We are going to hear now from Adeline Bennett Prempa. Uh, Adeline is dual qualified in, in the bar in England and Wales and also in Ghana. She's the founder and managing partner of BMP Associates in Ghana, board member of the Cyber Security Authority in Ghana, World Bank consultant for Ghana, and she's also a fellow of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. And I know that she is doing, she's putting a lot of effort and time on training and approaching international family lawyers to the organization to have a, a better uh, representation in the continent. So thank you, uh, Adeline, to be with us today. Thank you very much, Carolina, for that very kind introduction. I am very grateful and deeply honored uh, to be part of this program, especially with the rich lineup of speakers that I'm surrounded by of high achievers. Uh, when I was asked to speak on Ghana in terms of international uh, child protection, in terms of protection of our children, I, I gave it some thought uh, because I was very keen not to give you a glossy picture of, of Ghana's child protection framework. But let me start with the positives, and I'll end on a thought-provoking issue. So in Ghana, we have, like many other countries, we have a strong sense of family. Uh, we have uh, a very robust uh, child and family legal framework. And in fact, the 1992 Constitution guarantees uh, maximum protection for our children. So that's a starting point for me. We have a well-established legal framework. Uh, Ghana is, uh, should I say, uh, a post of uh, positivity when it comes to ratifying international conventions. Uh, our legal framework uh, reflects our ratification of a number of international conventions, our policies, and our initiatives that we take in the country. So I'm glad to say that Ghana was the first country in the world to ratify the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1990. And this convention, as we know, outlines a comprehensive framework for the protection of rights of children. Um, and that is reflected deeply in our laws as well. Similarly, Ghana went on to ratify the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child in 1990. This is not dissimilar from the UN uh, CRC, but it goes a step further and it complements providing additional protections and promoting the specific uh, cultural, social, and economic context of the African child, creating an environment where children's rights can be respected and promoted. Uh, on another positive note, in 2016, Ghana ratified the Hague Convention on Protection of Children and Cooperation in Respect of Intercountry Adoption. Um, the background to this was concerns, deep concerns in respect of child abuse uh, in our cultural community setting where children were being abused by extended family members uh, and th there was difficulty in penetrating in terms of investigation and finding out what was really going on on the ground. So the government commissioned an international social services uh, investigation and report back in 2013 this birthed our child and family uh, comprehensive family uh, comprehensive uh, policy framework. And then in 2016, we ratified uh, the Convention on Intercountry Adoption, and this is reflected in our national laws as well. So when we think of the local laws in Ghana, the predominant, uh, should I say, uh, the primary legislation in respect of children is the Children Act of 1998 which was amended in 2016 to bring in force um, the Intercountry Adoption Convention. There are other pieces of legislation that buttresses uh, this framework. Uh, one is the Juvenile Justice Act of 2023, which establishes the legal framework for the administration of juvenile justice in Ghana 
uh, protecting rights of children who find themselves in conflict with the law. We have a very comprehensive uh, piece of legislation in the form of the Domestic Violence Act of 2007, which addresses issues of domestic violence, but also particularly deals with children as victims uh, within the household when domestic violence occurs. We have uh, a well-structured and indeed a well-facilitated well domestic violence support unit, which is well-staffed with psychologists uh, to deal with children who suffered domestic violence. And we also have the Human Trafficking Act, which criminal, criminalizes uh, child trafficking. In recent times, by virtue of the Cybersecurity Act of 2020, we now have a new Cybersecurity Authority of Ghana, which I happen to be a board member of the Maiden Board. This authority houses a very dynamic child online protection division. And this ensures implementation of the child online protection measures that are reflected in our law, uh, working towards the goal of online protection for children and adolescents in particular, recognizing the need to protect such vulnerable groups, uh, promoting uh, cyber safety online. So after all these tries that Ghana has taken, what remains to be said? Uh, in one sentence, I'll say that Ghana needs to take active steps to ratify the Hague Convention on Civil Aspects of Child Abduction. Because despite the existence of our comprehensive legal policy framework, there are serious concerns in this area. Ghana is not a signatory to the Hague Convention on Civil Aspects of Child Abduction, and therefore we do not benefit from that structured legal framework. Albeit it's not perfect, at least as a starting point for us to deal with the prompt return of children wrongfully removed or retained within our jurisdiction. There has been a noticeable surge in recent years of children being abducted to Ghana by one parent without the consent of the other. This will come as no surprise because the world has become smaller and travel becomes more commonplace. Children are being removed from countries of habitual residence more frequently to other countries and Ghana is no exception. The reality is that when a child is wrongfully taken by one parent into another country, it creates a complex and distressing, sometimes hopeless situation that requires urgent attention and legal intervention. The absence, therefore, of a reliable framework of Ghana, such as the 1980 Convention, makes the situation all the more difficult. Typically, therefore, in the absence of, of such a convention or indeed any relevant bilateral agreements, the left-behind parent faces the ordeal of initiating substantive welfare custody proceedings in Ghanaian courts, with the real potential of such matters dragging on, hearing after hearing, sometimes appeal after appeal, until the point where the child is basically settled into the country. Until real efforts are made to ratify this convention, Ghana is at risk of becoming a haven for the abducting parent. The status quo is simply not adequate, and urgent steps need to be taken to address this, communicating a clear message that Ghana will not tolerate child abduction. In this effort, it is also the, there is also the need for international cooperation and collaboration. Collaboration among nations and professionals will enable the exchange of best practices and transfer of skill sets. The crucial role to be played by an international forum such as this one cannot be overemphasized. By fostering collaboration and cooperation, we can develop a unified global approach to child protection, ensuring that no child is left behind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. One day, one day, Adeline. We have one case at the moment that is a little boy. He's been taken to, to Ghana and it's really, really frustrating not to have that instrument to get the boy back as soon as possible to, to the UK. And from Ghana, we are moving to Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Maria Juliana Ruiz with us. Maria Juliana is a lawyer from Colombia, LM in American University, International Business Law. She's co-founder of IND, Innovation for Development Foundation, and she is the former first lady for Colombia. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's uh, truly an honor to be here and having the opportunity to share some of uh, 
the things that have been going on in our country in terms of protecting and uh, working to, to move forward in order to end violence against children in our country. And um, I'm a true believer that uh, actually preventing, acting, and hopefully eradicating all forms of violence against children is probably one of our essential ways to think about progress as humanity and uh, think about well-being for humanity. We must find the way to just disrupt and cut once uh, and forever this unfortunate continuous cycle of violence because it has been proved that a child that has been abused or a child that has been victim of violence will carry that for most of his life or her life. So um, this is something that I have as a, as a personal belief and as a personal commitment. Uh, as you mentioned, I had the opportunity of, honor, of serving my country and have the honor of being the First Lady of Colombia for the past four years. And uh, so I decided also to take this as, a, as an essential matter. Um, would, was like a starting point for us, and it's something that I would like to highlight in, in this panel, is education. And you mention it somehow, and it's how do we need to be educated in order to understand and believe on what is the unfortunate impact of violence in children? And how are there so many different ways of violence against children? And uh, something that we did in Colombia is uh, we, I tried to design, but at the same time promote as, as much as I could all of these programs who carry for um, SDG 5.2 and uh, SDG 16.2, which you probably know are the ones who protect mainly um, children and, and uh, call for ending violence against children. And uh, it was really important for Colombia also to start with facts. So we partner with um, the Ministry of Health and uh, the CDC in uh, Washington, D.C., to report the first survey in violence against children in Colombia done ever. The results were amazing. They first of all allowed us to talk about facts, not ideas, which was essential. We had a statistics for the first time. We were able to say from facts that it is true that there are different types of violence that affect different kind of children, that there is in fact a gender issue in terms of violence that women in the case of Colombia are um, more often affected by psychological violence then physical violence is the other way around in the case of physical violence. It affects uh, mainly uh, boys than girls. But at the same time, it also allowed us to understand that probably 70% of the offenders were either relatives, close family members, or within the most close family friends um, circle. So those are things that at least bring an alert and, and make us think as society how we can all be engaged in, in making these changes. This is not a matter also of just the government doing or just the civil society or just a specific group or organization uh, defending uh, children. It's a matter of every single person taking into account responsibility and actions. So uh, the government aware of this and having uh, the light of the facts decided to establish the National Alliance to End Violence Against Children. This brought together private sector, public sector, academia, international organizations, and uh, through different programs and projects we were able to include Colombia um, as a pathfinder country in the um, partnership, the global partnership to end violence against children. Why am I saying this? Because this, at some point, made us think about it, not, not as a local issue, but as a global big issue we should be taking care of. On the other hand, um, we also were able to move forward in terms of regulations and norms. And I was just listening and how, how, how the rules and the laws 
uh, make such an, an, an amazing uh, difference. In the case of Colombia, the president enacted uh, several, several uh, bills that I would say cover the, the children's in Colombia somehow. But I would mention three that for me were re really relevant. The first one was um, the life sentence for um, sexual abusers and murders of children. The second one, which I consider truly important because some of the things you were already mentioning is the prohibition of physical punishment or any kind of tr uh, cruel treatment towards children. This, I would make a huge start on it because when you go deep into, into the basics of, of the bill, I'm fully responsible for it as any other mother, parent, family member, friend of a kid to be aware that these are things that are truly affecting the children. Not only physically, if they have been physically um, abused, but at the same time, because it truly changes their state of mind. It truly affects, in a physiological way, the brain's development. So these are things that we will carry on for a long time. And, and uh, sometimes we, when we think about violence against children, we always think about major issues. Well, the fact is that sometimes parents, we, we do things that we shouldn't be doing. And we are somehow uh, being responsible for making this continuing in our society. And the third one that I think was also uh, quite important was the imprescriptibility for crimes of sexual abuse against children. This one, of course, has also a, a background on how long a child uh, would take before they tell the truth, yeah. or before they're able to understand what had happened to them, or how long would it take for a kid to even become an adult and embrace what has been suffering for a long time. So those three I would highlight, I probably will bring them to the table as an optimistic view of how things can really move forward. Um, my other optimistic view on, on this matter is we do need to work together. This is not a matter of politicians, not judges, uh, not civil society, on its own working, we do need to think on how to build up partnerships, how to think as a community and as a society, and how do we be really put um, human rights in the center, and how we start seeing children being the, the starting point of, of um, human rights. Thank you, thank you so much. Muchas gracias, María Juliana. Uh, it's been a lot, yeah, very optimistic uh, <laughs> news. We need that. <laughs> we are talking about child protection around the world and so many work that is, is needed. So as you say, collaboration, working together, and this is the, the aim of this uh, table, to bring these topics so we can all think what we can do in our countries. I heard that Colombia is doing great work on Hague Convention. They have the ideas there. We have Richard Min here. He's also a fellow of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. He does a lot of child adoption work. So it's really good to hear good news about uh, child protection around the world. And from Colombia, we are moving to España. <laughs> Sorry about the gender inequality in the panel. <laughs> so, Andres... <laughs> Andres Conde. Uh, Andres Conde is the CEO of Save the Children in Spain, and he's also the member of the Global Executive Committee of the organization. Uh, he was working before Save the Children for, for UNICEF. And he's going to talk to us about the, the, the legal system, the problems that he, they see from the legal systems as why or how we can protect children better. Thank you, Andres, for joining us. You have been very brave. Really pleased to be here. Very, very. I feel at home. I feel at home. I was in other panels. I was totally lost. But here, <laughs> okay, this is my language. This is... Uh, 
this is what, what we will care for. But well, first I take into account that I'm probably the only non-lawyer non in the room, and uh, English is not my mother language, so I'm totally out of my comfort zone. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I'm probably, I, I can bring like a different perspective because we do deal with child protection <coughs> issues. Child protection is, is probably one of the biggest strengths of Save the Children globally. But uh, I want to share with you what we see. I mean, our child protection specialists see when we do case management and we take them to court. What are the legal issues that we face, globally speaking? I mean, each country is totally different. Each region is actually different. But uh, there are some common, common trends that are challenging child rights uh, other than but other <coughs> countries, right? And uh, when we take them to court. So, uh, well, first, I think we have start, um, our colleagues already said so, but uh, we need to strengthen child protection at international level at the moment. We do need it. I mean, just take into account a few figures. Over one billion children are suffering violence in any form. It could be physical, emotional, sexual violence, or through neglect. Over one billion children, yeah, that's a lot. So over 12 million girls are forced to marry every year, every year. Last year, 43 million children were uh, forces, forcibly displaced uh, because of uh, armed conflict. So uh, even if, we, uh, even if uh, the right to survive and the right to be educated are still to be fulfilled globally, the biggest violation of, uh, of child rights in the world, the most widespread <coughs> one, are always on protection, especially if you think about girls. So what's the three things that we are seeing in, uh, in legal systems throughout the world that actually uh, are working? I think the, the first thing we have, to, we have to acknowledge is that, uh, that for us, the only mandatory entry point uh, the, uh, for any, any case is, that, uh, is considering that uh, child, children are rights holders and subjects of rights. Which for you is totally obvious, yeah. But the problem we're seeing is that this is increasingly being challenged. So, human rights in general are being challenged in the world. You know? Some people, some social and political forces are actually publicly challenging. Why human rights? Is this really uh, something useful? Is this is this the thing that we would sign now, not in 1948, but now? Or is this not a Western agenda? So we're seeing this increasingly. How is this affecting children? That we're seeing social and political forces challenging the fact that children are actually subject to rights or rights holders. This is happening in my own country, in Spain. I've talked to the leaders of the political force that actually is owns one third of the parliament and they said it directly. I mean, we'll always be one against the other because we don't think that children are child holders by themselves. No, they're part of the family. So it's a family, actually. They're their family property, in a way, I mean, to say it directly. So we have this challenge. Increasingly, people are seeing children as family property and not as child rights holders. And this is a really big issue. Actually, because of the Convention of Rights of the Child, the, probably the biggest achievement, achievement was this one, that they, it, it made sure for the world and it's still the most ratified uh, international treatment in history, it, uh, it made sure that children were uh, subjects of, of their own rights, right? And not just an object of protection. But uh, this is increasingly being challenged. Nevertheless, we do think that we still, I mean, we, we are firm believers in the, the power of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. We do think that we have a strong, solid, multi-actor system to protect children in the world through the CRC, but we have to defend it because it's going to, it's being challenged. So I'm asking you to defend it as lawyers. I'm asking the legal community to be behind it because it's being challenged. I mean, this political force I'm talking to you about actually asked Spain to be out of the Convention of the Rights of the Child because, because of it, there were many things we couldn't do to migrant children. So this happened a couple of years ago, right? in Spain. So, but we're seeing this happening in more and more countries. So we, we have to defend, not just case by case, not just sin, but make sure that the, the full system is being defended. 
by those who really believe in it. The, um, it's true that sometimes, and it's difficult for courts, we're seeing that increasingly, to accept international uh, decisions, international regulations to be adopted. Uh, we're increasingly seeing that. In, in my own country, we uh, very recently, the Supreme Court actually decided not to, uh, not to take to effect uh, a decision by the Committee of the, uh, the United Nations Committee Against Torture, uh, arguing that uh, those decisions were not binding for the Spanish government, right? So this is going to happen to the same decisions made by the Committee for the Rights of the Child, unless we defend it, uh, and it's time to do that, definitely. Second, second issue that we see globally happening, and we, we face a lot of problems because of this, is that justice is definitely not adapted to children nowhere in the world. Nowhere in the world. Well, some cosmetic uh, uh, tries to some things, uh, well, uh, but no, really, and this is a really big issue. We, we shouldn't, we, we have to keep working to make sure that we have a child-friendly justice system. Because otherwise, I mean, and this is not just about uh, judges, but also prosecutors, court clerks, and lawyers as a whole. It's the full family that have to understand that children have need, and, uh, need the system to be adapted to them. We don't listen to them. If we, don't, if we listen to them, we don't believe them. We don't believe them. In my country, 17 of sexual abuse cases take to, to police or don't get to court because children are simply not believed. They don't, we don't believe them. So, sing, sing, simple thing that we definitely should do. We have to take into account what they say, what they uh, actually care for, their opinion, and we have to prevent all the damage, the re-victimization that uh, can happen because of the way we treat them after something has happened to them. The, really, these processes are, well, well those of you who, who work with sexual abuse, you've seen it so many times that parents always say, look, much worse than the abuse itself was what happened before. Much worse. So really, this adaptation is mandatory. We should do something about it. We cannot re victimize in such a terrible way children throughout the world because it happens everywhere. So um, we need to change it. So if we are, if we really want that someday children who claim for their own rights, and they should. The legal system should be thinking of them, about them being able to claim for their own rights. Or if we want to gather the right evidence to find a fair solutions for those legal disputes that affect children. And the third thing we're seeing that, uh, that is worrying, and is more difficult, but the, the CRC's best, uh, biggest tenet uh, from our point of view is the is children's best interest such a powerful concept, such a, such a guiding principle for anything that, uh, that's related to children in, in legal issues. Uh, so their consideration should be primary in any decision that affect direct or indirect to them. Uh, wonderful. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. Uh, public authority, courts, in general, do have not developed best interest assessment in a systematic way. There are some examples, but they're, again, they're, they're a minority. We don't do that. But it would change so much for children if we do this assessment in a systematic way at, uh, at national level. So this is a three, uh, three things that we definitely should fight for if we're serious about protecting children from the legal system, from a practitioner point of view, not a, not a lawyer, but from people who actually work with, uh, with children directly in the field in, in fragile contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. It's a lot of information for us as practitioners to consider and to have in mind when we are protecting them in, in litigation, unfortunately. And now we move to Scotland. Are we ready, Rachel? <laughs> I'm ready. So we have Rachel Kelsey with us. Rachel is the president-elect of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. She's appointed by law president Scotland's more senior judge, 
to the Scottish Civil Justice Council, Family Law Subcommittee, and now in a third term of office. She has represented the International Academy of Family Lawyers at the Hague Conference on Private International Law, Parentage and Surrogacy Project since 2019. Rachel is the only Hall of Fame lawyer in Family Law Scotland in the Legal 500 and has been described by both Chambers and Partners and the Legal 500 as the doyen on Family Law in Scotland. Her practice is wide-ranging and covers all family law issues, but she has a particular interest in matters with a jurisdictional element and those where there are privacy concerns. And I don't know how she has managed to squeeze in her diary these three days or four days in New York. So I'm I really... You, if, it, if, if, if this was happening in Glasgow, I might have been busy. <laughs> I will be honest. So thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us. Thank you, Carolina. Well, thank you all. Um, it is an enormous honour to be here with you. Um, I am going to try uh, and speak briefly. Um, those of you who know me know that that is a challenge. Brief is not usually a word that is used to describe how I speak. Um, what I thought about was you really don't want to hear about Scotland. There are things that can be said about Scotland, and I'm very proud of, of the work that we are trying to do and have been trying to do in recent years, particularly with the incorporation of the UNCRC uh, in our domestic law. But... Uh, I think what is more useful probably at this point um, is if I give you a little bit of um, some thoughts about uh, from a more global perspective and possibly then a, 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 a focusing in a little bit on Europe um, when we think about what is going on in the world now in relation to parentage, parenthood, filiation, we have lots of different words. Um, and one of the things that um, I had been going to say was one of the things that's interesting is in most parts of the world, we can share a common consensus on what is a child. Um, given what Lavanya said earlier, um, she is absolutely right to say we might all recognise that a four-year-old was a child, but is an eight-year-old a child for criminal law purposes, as an 11-year-old, a child for the purposes of immigration or whatever. But I think we all have a kind of broad consensus that certainly before you get into double digits, we know what a child is. Um, where things diverge enormously globally is in the concept of what is a parent. And for many children, and I'm very struck by what you said earlier, that the idea of the parent being the person who is providing the protection for the child or adolescent may often be wrong. And actually the parent may be the source of the abuse rather than the protection. But taking your positive ending, let's be positive and say that uh, a, a child having a parent or parents can be a good protecting factor for the child. Um, the whole issue of who is a parent has become very, very timely. Uh, it is a very timely issue just now. It's become a real challenge. Um, in a European context, and I, I will still always consider myself a European, um, as far as I'm concerned, we left uh, Europe. I didn't leave. Um, so I'm choosing to ignore Brexit. Um, so from a European perspective, we, we can see the challenges that, that, uh, that arise now. We had the baby Sarah case um, 18 months ago, which was about a, a, a little girl born to a Spanish and a Bulgarian, no, in fact, a Gibraltar and a, a, a Bulgarian mother born in Spain. Um, and this, so two lesbian mothers, um, and case went to the, the CJEU, which was in relation to this child, this European child's ability to exercise their rights. As a rights holder in their own capacity, irrespective of their age, what was this child's freedom of movement rights across the European Union? Um, and so we're seeing, we're drilling down more and more on the issues where parentage matters, and it's not simply about some of the things that we have habitually thought about, which is about succession law, which is about domicile, which is about status. Um, it's become much, um, much broader than that. Now, I did have some bits um, and pieces to talk about the many and varied ways that in different countries, different jurisdictions, we attribute 
parentage, whether it's, it's motherhood, whether it's fatherhood, and, and some of the ways that we have started to manage situations where you have same-sex parents, where you have multiple parents. Um, certainly in the UK at the moment and in many other jurisdictions, we, we, are, we are now grappling with the reality where, with advances in technology, with the ability to separate out mitochondrial DNA, we have children who have the biological DNA of three people. They have biologically three parents. How do we manage that within our legal systems? Um, but I'm not going to do that because you will find Daniela much more interesting than me, and I don't want to um, impede on her time. So what I'm going to do is tell you about two things to be alive to. If you want more information, come and find me, or you can get stuff on the web, but to be aware of it. Um, the Hague Conference on Private International Law uh, started a project. Um, so we're first mandated to do this project. It's been talked about for over a decade. But the work started in 2015 on a project to look at the possibility of there being an international convention. Um, we've talked about the, 19, the, the 1980 convention, the 1996 convention, 1993 convention, to have a convention which would deal with parentage. Um, and the thinking was that this was going to be potentially controversial, so there would be a convention on parentage which would be easier for states to sign up to, and then there would be an optional protocol for what are called ICES, international surrogacy arrangements. Um, that work has been ongoing. Um, the final report of the experts group um, was uh, made in November of last year. Um, it's been a fascinating project. I had the privilege um, of participating as on behalf of the, of the IAFL, as uh, Carolina mentioned, um, where we had observer status along with UNICEF um, in that project. Um, the council of the, the um, it's called CGAP, so the states uh, who are participants to uh, the permanent, the, the uh, Hague conference, have mandated now that a working group be set up and that work is now ongoing. Um, those of us on the experts group were um, pleasantly and very surprised at, at one level because this has been really difficult work. The feasibility of trying to get an instrument um, given the very different cultural and legal traditions that we operate in um, it is a real challenge. Um, and I think my own personal view um, it, it is perhaps unsurprising that the politicians, let put, let's put it that way, are saying, you academics, lawyers, you need to find a solution to this because it is becoming more and more of a practical problem in society now, that we are seeing children who are being born through surrogacy that is not going to go away, um, and yet we do not have legal systems that, that adequately manage that, let alone when one considers this through the lens of the child as a rights holder. Um, and this is at a time when we are looking at conferences that are going to be taking place which are framed in terms as being the manufactured child. And this is being thought about from the perspective of the adult's rights as parents. Um, rather than the rights of the child to have identity, to be aware of their identity and so on. So that's the one thing I'm already not being brief. Second one is there is going to potentially be um, a European Union regulation on the recognition of parenthood between member states. Um, I don't think that will happen in my lifetime any more likely than it is that we'll go back into the EU in my lifetime. Um, but I can live in hope on both. Um, the more likely outcome is that there will be um, a discrete um, protocol which will be enhanced cooperation. That has been followed in other family law areas in the EU. Um, but watch this space. And I'm sorry, Carolina, I didn't stick to no, my no. seven minutes. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And now we are going to finish uh, in going to Chile. We are going to hear from Daniela Horvitz. I don't need her CV. I know her <laughs> all my career. 
So Daniela, uh, educated in Harvard University, California School of Law, Pontificia Universidad Cat Católica, no. Universidad de Chile, and Universidad Diego Portales. First Chilean fellow of the International Academy of Family Lawyers, former president of IJUDEFA, the Association of International Family Lawyers in Spanish. Um, I want to highlight so many things, but that she was... Best uh, dressed. Best, best dressed. In the world, best dressed. She has been honored to be pro bono as a guardian ad litem in cases of children in yes. violation at the request of the family courts. So, Daniela, child protection in Chile. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. As you can see, uh, I, I am not a very good lawyer, but I have very good friends, as you all can see. <laughs> A uh, personal, uh, personal <laughs> photographer, public, so really, I'm a pop star of the family law. Now, I'm very ashamed because uh, um, I prepare in Spanish. I blame the chair. Uh, yes. No, no. And I am the, the last one, um, and I will be speaking very shortly because this happened when you are very close friend of the chair as well. So you have to uh, fix uh, your time. Uh, we are here to speak about international protection of minors, but I, I want to bring here something very local. Uh, probably most of you are aware of what was going on in Chile in 2019, in October. A very big and important uh, social unrest happened, and meaning at the end of the process, they, they located in between October and December 2019, just before COVID, we had 3,400 injuries, 34 deaths, and three million people marching and protesting just in Santiago. We are in Santiago, we have five million people. So three million people in the streets is something, it's really something. And uh, why? Because of the inequality of the social rights non-recognized or not enforceable, about many things, and how this ended, or supposedly uh, was going to end, about creating a new constitution. Uh, we have a uh, old constitution written under dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet that uh, was not uh, backed by the people in any way. So everybody think that a good, thought that a good solution was to create a new constitution for these new times. And in between all the discussions that we have in Chile was how are we going to recognize children or minor rights in this new constitution. So uh, for a whole year, we, ah, and so people went to election, a referendum, and 80% of our population decide that the solution was to create a new constitution. Uh, you will see how, how crazy is my country, but after that, and we were sure that 80% is enough to have a beautiful and modern new constitution. Uh, so we elect many people uh, a convention uh, to create this new constitution, and I have to say that my photographer is not just my photographer, but is married to one of uh, the guys, uh, a very distinguished law professor that was working in this project. And after a very hard work, they create a project in where the children's rights were very well recognized. And as you were talking, uh, Pam, uh, particularly in indigenous uh, population and LGBTQ plus children were recognized and protected in this project. But what happened after this year, 60% of the population reject this project. Because probably we were too modern, we were going too far, and now we want to be a little bit more conservative. Now in which stage are we now? Uh, we brought uh, a group of, of experts no, from the right, left centers everywhere to create a new project. And uh, we have here a project because this is uh, working progress still in 2023. We are still, Chile is like this. We take it long for everything. Um, so, and how are children or families recognized in this new project? I'm sorry, I prepare in Spanish, so I'm translating at the same time. Really, please forgive me about this. But in the Article 3, something that for me is very important says that the family is the fundamental core or center of the society and is duty of the state and society to provide protection 
to the families. And why I pointed families? Because in the current constitution it says the family, only one kind of family. So here we were moving, or we are moving at, le at least a little bit forward, recognizing that we have different kind of families. And in, in, in regarding children particularly, the Article 14 says that the Constitution recognizes and ensures the best interest of uh, children and says girls, boys, and adolescents, and the conditions to grow up and develop in their family. Uh, well, this is not much you could say, no? Uh, but could be in the Constitution now, Children's rights are not in the Chilean constitution. And so why I bring this subject to international protection of minors, this is something so local. But I think that the first thing that we could work as a task force is exactly on this, to recognize properly children's rights in our main uh, in our main rules, in, in our system, civil code system, is the constitution. No, and why is so important? Because we could say, well, but, but we have the International Convention of Children's Rights that is also recognized in almost every constitution as a soft law. We apply it in our internal law, but in my point of view, it's not exactly the same. When we need a formal recognition, um, how we protect and promote these rights is first of all recognizing properly. Uh, we have to move from this concept, and he talked about it in a very, very specific way, from considering children object of protection and care, moving to subject of rights. And this is completely different. If we understand that and we put it in a proper way in our fundamental uh, institutions and law, so we also provide judiciary system with instruments uh, or tools to interpret the other rules, giving priority to the children's rights. Uh, I'm running, of course, uh, out of time. Uh, I think that um, a comment to, to Carolina before uh, uh, yesterday about the very good news that in July now uh, they were published the principle of Maastricht about human rights of the future generations. And it's an amazing uh, document. But I wonder <laughs> how we're going to protect future generations, or are we taking care of future generations if we are not able to take care of our own children that are this generation. Thank you. Uh, perfect ending for a fantastic uh, meeting. Uh, it's been uh, fantastic to hear all of you, different topics. And I've been 20 years in England, and I am very proud that I am keeping the, the time. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone wants to make any comments or any questions, we are running late overall in the whole program, so happy if you want to do it, but uh, if not, we are around for any, communi any communication that you want to have with any, any of us in the, in the panel. Thank you so much for all of you for being with us, and thank you, to, please, the last uh, applause for all the uh, amazing thank speakers. You.